Would you open your Bibles with me, or Bible apps, or whatever you're using, to Psalm 88. Psalm 88. I remind you that I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Psalm 88, a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah to the choir master, according to Mahalath Leonoth, a Moscow of Heman the Ezraite. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength, like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. Selah. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eyes grow dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Selah. Is your steadfast love declared in the grave? Or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness, or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O Lord, cry to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My, my companions have become darkness. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. May he bless it to the hands, hearts, and minds of his people. As we've gone through this summer, we've looked at a variety of different kinds of psalms. And today we come to what is often called a lament psalm. A lament is a cry. It is a cry from a place of great suffering and darkness. And what is unique about Psalm 88 is that often laments in the book of Psalms end on a positive note. They say, God, why have you left me? Yet I will still praise you. But Psalm 88 is often called the saddest of the Psalms because it ends by saying, my companions have become What is it that we want to learn from this psalm this morning? The first thing that I would like to mention is that it's important that we deal with the reality of suffering. And in order to do so, I'd like to share with you a story of a family that, get, that went through a great deal of suffering. Joe and Mary Lou Bailey were a real-life couple whom God tested beyond what I think many would endure. Joe was in the Lord's work, working in a Christian organization with students and writing for Christian magazines. They had a happy family, three sons and a daughter. Then tragedy struck. One of their young sons developed leukemia, and at the age of five, he died. As Joe tells it in a book he wrote afterward, Danny died in his own bed with his mother and father next to him, comforting him, loving him, and telling him about Jesus' love in heaven. The family had always spoken of these things, and Danny had responded with the simple faith of a child and what his parents said. That day, though, Danny did not want to go to heaven. He wanted to stay, to be with his mom and dad, his brothers and his sister, in his own home. He didn't want to leave all that he knew, but he did. He didn't leave. He died that day. Then God gave the Baileys the hope of new life again. They were expecting another baby, and they rejoiced. Still, when the day came, the baby was born with a severe handicap. They named him John, but on the second day of his life, 
he also died. The Baileys had lost two children. It's been said the most severe trauma a parent can suffer is the death of their own child. Statistics show that divorce rates skyrocket in families in which a child dies when neither parent can reach out to the other beyond his or her own grief. Yet the Baileys lost two sons. But God was not finished with them yet. A few short years later, their 18-year-old son, Joe, had a freak sledding accident. And he was a hemophiliac. And so after this sledding accident, he bled to death. Seven years, three sons, three deaths. Joseph Bailey wrote a poem after the death of his son, Joe. And I'd like to read you a part of that. This is what he said. Let me alone, Lord. You've taken from me what I'd give your world. I cannot see such waste that you should take what poor men need. You have a heaven full of treasure. Could you not wait to exercise your claim on this? Oh, spare me, Lord. Forgive that I may see beyond this world, beyond myself, your sovereign plan, or see and not may trust you, spoiler of my treasure. Have mercy, Lord. Here is my quick claim. Maybe many of us haven't experienced the kind of depth of despair that the Bailey family experienced in the death of their three sons. But nonetheless, we have our own moments of suffering and despair. And the question we have to ask this morning is, what does God's Word say about that? What are we meant to do with that despair, with that suffering, with that experience that we feel, that dark night of the soul where we feel that God has left us, that God is no longer caring for us, that God does not have our back, and that God does not want our best? Well, if there could be anything that we can learn from Psalm 88, it would be that even in despair, cry out to the Lord. Even in suffering, cry out to the Lord. Even in that dark night of the soul, cry out to the Lord. Even in your anger, cry out to the Lord. That it's okay to ask God questions like, God, do you even care? God, are you even listening anymore? Have you left me completely? So we look at this psalm this morning and we ask this question of the psalmist and his own experience, him and the Ezraite. We don't know the details about exactly what type of suffering he was experiencing, but we know it was deep and it was great and it was mighty. And so let's look at this first point together, a prayer when troubles come. One thing that we have to take into consideration here is the very first thing we're told about what Heman the Ezraite did with his great suffering and his moment of despair, whatever that might have been, a sickness or an illness. He was speaking to God of it. He says, O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. And the first thing that we must mention in this discussion, this lament, is this. That in moments of great despair and in moments of great suffering, we have one choice. Is this going to be something that is going to draw us closer to God, to the heart of God? Or is this going to be something that pushes us away? And here we see that even though Ezra or the Ezraite, him and the Ezraite might be experiencing great suffering, great despair, he is bringing this to God. As has often been said, the moment you are angry with God, you are right where you're meant to be. Because how can you be angry with someone who doesn't exist? You think that God can't handle your anger? Your hurt? Your suffering? That God does not know what you are going through? So bring it to Him in prayer. He in the Ezra says, My soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. 
I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm a man who has no strength, like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You've caused my companions to shun me. You've made me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eyes grow dim through sorrow. Him and the Ezraite says, Lord, I'm praying for you, but this is what I want you to know. I feel so deep in suffering and despair that it's as if I'm dead. And in the Old Testament, there was a cloudy picture of what that afterlife looked like. There wasn't a full revelation of what that afterlife looked like. And so for him and the Ezraite, he's asking the question, Lord, are you going to let me die? Because if I die, you'll remember me no more. I'll be cut off from your hand. I'll be forgotten. And it's not only that him and the Ezraite is experiencing this great suffering and despair, but that whatever it is that he's going through has isolated him. Look at what he says of his friends, those that should have been by his side. You've caused my companions to shun me. You've made me a horror to them. I'm shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. But I want you to take note of something very important. Very important in what Heman the Ezraite is experiencing. He understands that ultimately, what he is going through comes from God. Listen to what he says in verse 7. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. Now, I'm not up here telling you that all the suffering that you experience in life, you must accredit to God's hand. But I think you need to deal with that question. Because even if you don't believe that all things come to you from your Heavenly Father, good and bad, although there's plenty of Scripture to point to that, you have to admit at least that God is permitting it to happen. Have you never heard the question, if God is all-powerful and God is all-good and God is all-loving, then why is it that He allows these evil things to happen? And maybe, maybe it's easy to look over in Africa and say, oh, those kids with AIDS, why is God allowing that to happen? But it becomes something different then, right? When you yourself are experiencing suffering, you yourself are experiencing hardship and difficulty, you yourself are going through a great loss. And God is a sovereign God. So God, why are you allowing this to happen in my life? That's a completely legitimate question to ask. What's the intention of this? You have to read the book of Job and, and understand that what happens in the book of Job is that Job is living this wonderful life. He's worshiping God. And, and one day, Satan comes into the heavenly throne room and, and God says, hey, Satan, what do you think of my servant Job? And, and Satan says, the only reason that Job worships you is because you're helping him out. You're giving him a good life. You're blessing him with all these children and all these resources. If you take that away, then Job won't be with you. Job will not abide by that. Job will not worship you anymore. And so God says, okay, Satan, I give you permission. to bring suffering into Job's life. That's there. And so then we have to ask the question, is there a reason, God, for what I am going through? Or is this just purposeless evil that just happened to hit me in this cosmic accident called life? Him and the Ezraite does not believe that. He attributes what he is going through to the hand of God. That's why he's praying to God. Because God is the one who's sovereign over his own suffering, his own despair. And so he prays to God when troubles come. Do you pray to God 
when troubles come into your life? Are you saying, God, I know that you are sovereign, that you are in control, but why does this have to happen to me? Why is this going on with me? Why do I have to experience this loss? Why do I have to experience this despair? Why do I have to experience this depression? I can never be happy. I don't know what's wrong with me. Why do I feel like this? And it's important to know that we can do that. That we can do that. You know, you, you turn on K-Love and you listen to positive and encouraging radio. That's a Christian radio station, right? You listen to all these Christian songs and it's got a pop and a beat to it and, and there's this positivity about it. And you begin to think that it's wrong as a Christian to experience suffering and depression. That there's something wrong with you. Then you go and you read the Psalms and you realize that God's very own word says, I have permission to feel this way and call myself a Christian. And that's freeing. And it's important. It's important because we're not promised a lot of things in life. But one of the things that the Bible promises us that we will experience is suffering and hardship and the Christian journey. Look at this second point, prayer when facing death. He in the Israelites says, Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? He is calling to God and he's saying, God, if you let me die, how can I continue to worship you and praise you? Reminding you, again, that in the Old Testament, there was a cloudy understanding of the afterlife, a cloudy understanding of what it means to die. And there was a sense in which the people in the Old Testament were uncertain about whether there was a continuation with life past the grave. And here, him and the Ezraite expresses that. He says, God, if I'm dead, what, can, what good can I do for you? And we all, as New Testament believers, understand, well, God remembers the dead. There, there is life after this life. That there's a continuation of life beyond the grave. But Heman Ezra, he doesn't sense that. He doesn't know that. He's uncertain about that. So he expresses this prayer when he is facing the reality of death. I remember reading The Pilgrim's Progress some time ago. It's one of the great Christian stories. It's the most printed book besides the Bible. And if you've never read it, I encourage you to do so. And in that story, two men come to the end of their life, and they cross the River Jordan. And these two men are Christians, and what they're doing is they're entering into heaven. And with uh, these two men, there are two separate experiences. One is this experience of understanding the certainty of the God's promise of the life that they have in Jesus Christ as they cross the river. And we're told that this man crosses the river and he has no problems keeping his head above water. He has no problems crossing it without any complications. And he enters into the promised land, enters into heaven, knowing full well that God had promised him this. But the other man was a Christian as well. And he begins to suffer and experience doubts as he's crossing the Jordan. And the waves come up above his head, and he struggles as he comes across the Jordan. And you know what? He still makes it into the promised land, still enters into heaven. And I've always found that that was interesting that Bunyan decided to add those two perspectives so that we might know that when we come to the end of our life, everybody is going to have a different experience with that. Some may struggle with doubts, worrying about what is on the other end of this existence. Some may have assurance and conviction. And in both both experiences are completely legitimate experiences for Christians. They don't disqualify you. 
they're valid. But finally, we end with a prayer when darkness surrounds. Heman says, but O Lord, I cry to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept me over. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You've caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. actually like the way the NIV ends Psalm 88. It says, I believe, my only friend is darkness. It reminds me of a song, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, right? And I don't know if that was inspired by this particular psalm, but the feeling is the same. The imagery that it elicits is the same. It's this idea that There is not a sense of hope beyond what you are experiencing in that moment. That you have moments in your life, even as a Christian who knows all the promises of God and all the promises of life to come and all the promises of greater um, blessing. But in this moment that you are experiencing, you feel without hope. You feel the darkness is all around. You can't see beyond the darkness. You don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. It seems more real to you that this will always be your experience, that you will always be shrouded in this darkness without anybody around, with no friends with you. Maybe you might feel like Mr. Bailey who even in his despair cried out to God, let me alone. Have mercy. But if you're feeling like that, and if you've ever felt like that, I want to remind you that something that is very unique and specific and beautiful about the Christian faith and the question of suffering. And that is that we have a God who's not indifferent towards the reality of suffering and despair. We have a God that did not look down upon all the suffering and despair that He saw without pity. We have a God that even though we rebelled against Him and said, we don't need you, God. And He had every right to say, I'm done with you. Look down upon our suffering and our state of despair and our state apart from God and His mercy. And He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put on flesh just like that. going to walk among them. And the Son of God came, Jesus Christ lived. And I want you to know something very wonderful about our Savior. Our Savior is not described like Santa Claus as some cheery, happy, jolly guy with rosy cheeks who never experiences any moment of sadness or grief. The Bible says that Jesus is a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. The Bible speaks of a Jesus who wept at the reality of death and despair. The Bible speaks of a Savior who in the garden was in such despair over the reality of the suffering he was about to experience on the cross, he sweat blood. The Bible speaks to us of a Jesus whose back was torn so badly by the whip 
whose head was crushed by the crown of thorns. And if that physical pain and suffering is not enough, he went to the cross and he experienced the wrath of God against sin. And on that cross he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting for himself the very words of a lament in the book of Psalms. The Bible tells us of a Savior who died, who himself experienced the reality of death. In a very real way, you could say that Psalm 88 is a prayer that Jesus said himself. So when we go to God with our suffering and we say, God, why? One thing that we can be reminded of that he understands. He is not a God who, because he is so high above us and so different from us, cannot sympathize with us, cannot possibly understand our experience in this life. When we say to God, why, God, do I have to suffer like this? Why, God, do I have to experience this, de this despair, this depression? We have a God that can say, I know what that feels like. I have suffered. I have despair. In my life, in the life of Jesus Christ, and the suffering of the cross. I know suffering like you will never know. The experience of hell itself. So that I could bring you resurrection and life. So even in despair, cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in despair, know that God is not far from you. He is near to you in Jesus Christ. Even in despair and suffering, know that God can handle your hurt. God can handle your anger. God can handle what you are going through because He Himself showed that the way to salvation and the way to growth in the form of Jesus Christ is through suffering. It's through the path of the cross. know that we have a God who hears our cries. We have a God who's with us. Even in our darkest moments. Even on the bridge of death. Even when trouble comes and darkness surrounds. He is there. He hears us. Pray to Him. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank You that you have washed us in the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that we would know our Savior as one who suffered, but suffered for a purpose, to bring salvation, to bring life, to bring resurrection, to bring joy, ultimate, final, and everlasting joy. And Lord, may we know that even though we experience suffering and despair and depression in this life, even though we experience darkness, even though we experience hardship, the reality of evil and hurt and loss, that we know there is a, a day coming. If you can just help us to hold on, if you can be our grace and our strength, there is a day coming when all despair, all suffering, all darkness, all evil, all hurt, all loss will be taken away, will be gone. And that we would know, Lord, that the Psalms tell us that you collect our tears in bottles, that you, you remember our hurts, you remember our cries, you remember what we have gone through, Lord. 
and that all these things are for a purpose and that you have promised that you will work all things for the good of those who love you and who are called according to your purpose. And that we may be reminded that even in this life, whatever hurt, whatever harm, whatever um, hell we might experience, Lord, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And we ask this in Jesus' most holy and precious name. Amen.